Well, it'd be good to have Luke chapter 1 open uh, in front of you. Uh, we'll be thinking about some of the things that we read last time when we uh, entered into this first, uh, the first of the series in the life of John the Baptist. And uh, what we're going to do this morning is just think about the early life of John the Baptist, particularly uh, growing up in the uh, household of uh, Elizabeth and Zechariah. Uh, and of course we have very little data about that, we're not told very much about his early life at all, though we are told uh, a, a, a few things in the promises uh, that came about at the beginning of uh, uh, John's uh, life, his conception uh, and uh, his birth. So we're going to draw upon those things to think about what it would be like for John being prepared and trained and equipped for the, the ministry uh, that God had uh, pre- prepared for him. Uh, and so uh, let, let me just, uh, okay, so the titles are up there already, that's good. So that's the way I'm going to be looking at uh, the uh, subject this morning. And uh, probably those uh, uh, children who are here this morning have groaned already because you've only just finished school and you've turned up at church and we're going to talk about school all the way through. Uh, But uh, uh, the truth is, we're all at school, we're all learning all the time. The Lord is uh, teaching us, he is showing us things, he's revealing himself to us, he's uh, revealing his word to us, he is taking us through experiences, Uh, he is is showing us people around us that we're watching and and looking at and listening to and learning from. And that was the case for John, uh, we call him John the Baptist, in his early life, born into this household, Uh, with uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth and I said last time uh, they were the perfect couple in that their names made up a a sentence Uh, and uh, it just struck me I I haven't watched the film I think it's in Love Actually where Hugh Grant says to the woman he loves you complete me and it's something that everybody chuckles at because it's a little bit corny and embarrassing well in in, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth's case it was true They did complete one another because their names made up a sentence. Zechariah means the Lord has remembered. And Elizabeth means God has remembered his promises. So together they made the sentence, the Lord has remembered his promises. And now of course they have a son. And unusually the son's name was to be John. They didn't follow the normal naming traditions uh, of those times in that he would be named after his father. That would uh, be the thing that is ordinarily done. But the angel said he's going to be called John. And uh, in the uh, rather amusing scene that you see from verse 57 down to verse 66, there's quite a comical scene, isn't there? You know, we, we all do it, don't we? It's like when you're speaking to someone uh, who, who's a foreigner who uses a different language, you shout because that makes English more understandable when it's shouted at a foreign person, doesn't it? Well, here we have a similar situation in that uh, Zechariah can't speak, but he can hear. And what you see is that uh, they're they're questioning this. His mum has said he's going to be called John. They said, no, that isn't how it works. And they start waving their hands around at Zechariah, who then writes on the tablet, his name is John. And does anybody know what the name John means? Some of you might. It means the Lord is gracious. The Lord is gracious. So now we have an even longer sentence uh, that this family forms. Zechariah, the Lord is remembered. Elizabeth, his promises. And John, to be gracious. What an amazing thing to grow up in a family that has that meaning, that purpose, that significance. And so as John is growing up, he's surrounded by and immersed in this very thought that he is part somehow of God remembering his promises to be gracious to the people of Israel first, but also to the whole world. And these people are godly people. We're told in the the previous uh, part of the the chapter that they were righteous. It's something that's incredible to say about a couple. They were practically righteous. They lived their lives in accordance with the laws of God. 
And so from the very beginning of John's life, he had an example, a lived out practical example of what it means to really know God, to really believe in him, to really trust him and to want to follow and serve him. He grew up watching his parents living out their lives in the reality of what it means to follow God. Now, of course, we can't make constant comparisons between John's life and uh, the lives of ourselves and and our children. There's a couple of things about John that set him apart uh, completely. Uh, For a start, we are told in verse, uh, right back in verse 15, this John is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. Uh, That sadly isn't going to be the case for any of us in these days. This was a particular, uh, a unique Uh, and and peculiar uh, act of God to fill a child with the Holy Spirit before he is even born. And we're also told in verse 14, or or, uh, Zechariah and, and Elizabeth are told, he will be a joy and a delight to you. Well, of course, they can have a baby, and it's a uh, long-awaited baby. It's a long-yearned-for and prayed-for baby. Uh, And every baby is the delight of their parents. But, of course, they have a particular promise here, that throughout his life, as long as they knew him, he was going to be a joy and a delight to them. That's a wonderful promise that they had. It is not a promise that is made to any of us, of course. We have a duty as parents to be faithful to God, to live out our lives, being a a model, an example and a testimony to our children to point them to the Lord Jesus. But there is no guarantee in our circumstances that our children will therefore naturally grow up to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, The the Christian household is not a, a sausage machine which inevitably produces children who will follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is a uh, great sadness. We, we know that some of the most faithful and devoted of God's people, the parents that have raised children, some of the most godly and earnest of his people have had the, the sadness of seeing their children walk away from the faith. It's equally true, uh, and it is wonderfully true, that children who grow up in households that are not Christian at all come to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour. And so there is a difference here. We must remember that John is a remarkable and unique work of God. But that still didn't stop Zechariah and Elizabeth from having the worries and concerns, the doubts and fears, undoubtedly at times, about how John was going to grow up. Were they doing the right thing? Were they raising him in the right way? Was he sort of obviously on the track of becoming whatever God had purposed him to become. And so let's think, first of all, about homeschooling. Homeschooling, not the kind of homeschooling that you've immediately thought of, but the kind of homeschooling that takes place in every Christian home always, or in every home, in fact. But let's uh, keep it to our Christian homes at this time. 24 hours a day, you as parents are conducting home school. Now, some of you have had a taste of it over the last year or so, and you don't particularly like it. Some others have really jumped at it and really enjoy the idea of teaching their own children science and maths and arts and all those kinds of things. But every Christian parent is involved in home school. Not just sitting down formally and saying, let's learn about this, but actually by the way that they live, by the way that they speak, by what their values are, by what their attitudes are, by their conduct one to another, by their relationship to the, to the church and to the word of God and to Christ, by their attitudes to service and all of those things, they are homeschooling children, demonstrating what it is to walk in the ways of the Lord, showing the things that are important to them, showing the values that they hold. And that's an awesome thought, isn't it? 
that there is in our families, if we, we have children, and we certainly have all been children, that there is someone who is observing us all the time, taking in that information, taking in what they're seeing, taking in the data and processing it, and it's influencing who they are becoming. And what we want to be sure as Christian parents is that we never do anything which would be responsible for turning our children's hearts away from the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot make them Christians. We cannot force them to be Christians. Though sometimes we, we try and sometimes we'd love to, to, to be sure. If we could do it for them, we would do it for them, but we can't. But what we have to do is to be faithful and to be prayerful, just like we know Zechariah and Elizabeth were, and to be good models and examples of what it means to love the Lord their God. It's an awesome responsibility. Long before we send our kids off to learn about maths and science and all of those kinds of things, which we haven't got a clue about, we have taught them a huge amount. We have set in front of them models and examples of what it means to love God. We've shown them what, what things are important in our lives. It would be interesting in Zechariah and Elizabeth's case, John uh, is growing up in a priestly family. Every now and again his father would go off up to Jerusalem and he would perform his service. Uh, and the, John would be learning what service was. He would be learning uh, what uh, it meant to serve God, both in the temple but also in the wider sense. And we need to, to give that example of, of service and, and commitment, obedience, what it means to follow. And I had uh, chosen the hymn, the song that we've just sung, and I didn't realise how... Uh, 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 Phil was going to take that uh, little saying about setting your hand to the plough and not turning back. But it's about following, isn't it? Despite all the challenges that might lie in our way, overcoming the obstacles, following Christ as our first and primary goal and objective as his people. This last year has uh, certainly given us some challenges in terms of doing just that. I want to uh, pay credit to the, not here this morning because it's bank holiday weekend and so many have gone away and we're really glad that they've had the opportunity to go away but uh, so many of the families have been here whenever they can be in the course of the last however many months we've been allowed uh, to do this when one loses track of times but uh, that shows what a commitment there is to God's house, to the, the worship of God's house, to the service of God's house, to the fellowship of God's people. And it's hard enough for us as grown-ups to be here. We're, we're muzzled, we're separated, there's empty chairs everywhere, and at certain times we weren't even allowed to talk to one another in the car park. This is tough. But there are many of you who have determined to be here, and that's been a real blessing and a real encouragement. And then, of course, you've had the additional problem of having those wriggly kids for whom there's even less than usual in the church. No, no spotlight, no Sunday school. But you've said to them, whether you've said it with words or simply by your actions and your testimony, this is important. It's important we're here. It's important that we meet. It's important that the doors of the church are open. The lights are on. It's important the community knows the church is still alive. It's important that we go and worship God together, even if it's really hard and at times a little bit miserable. To not even be able to sing. But you've said something to your children and to the wider fellowship as well. What this last year has done in Christian families is, is given an opportunity to demonstrate how important the things of God are. Whether it's just making sure that at 10.30 on a Sunday morning the family are gathered. They might be in their onesies and in their slippers. They might still have uh, uh, shreddies or something hanging off their lips, but it doesn't matter. We have to be ready for worship. And worship's going to be on the telly or on the computer screen, but it's better than nothing, way better than nothing. 
the witness and the testimony of those things can't be overestimated. Zechariah and Elizabeth, righteous, godly, faithful, devoted, and serving uh, man and woman that John can, can watch and admire and be drawn to the God that they loved. They were obviously people of the word and they were people of prayer. They were people of service. They were people who had spiritual priorities. And also I think there was an honesty about them as well. Uh, you remember that business where the angel tells Zechariah everything that's going to happen and, and Zechariah says, um, I'm not so sure about this. I'm really not sure uh, whether this is really going to happen, whether how this is actually going to work. And the angel says, well, because you doubted me, I've come from God. Because you doubted me, you'll not speak until these events actually take place. Perhaps if it's anything like our household, and it needn't necessarily be, but at many a meal table when there are guests, uh, perhaps John would say, Dad, why don't you tell him about how you didn't believe the angel? And he'd have to go through it all again. But there's an honesty, undoubtedly. They were righteous, but they weren't perfect. And Zechariah was a priest, and yet he was a man too. And he was someone who knew what it was to fail, as well as to walk faithfully before God. And one of the things we certainly need in our Christian households is humility and honesty about the realities of following the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone who gives that impression that it's always going to be easy, and again, how useful our children's talk was this morning. The Lord Jesus said, uh, this is not going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. And we need to acknowledge that sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes there are struggles and challenges, trials and disappointments, hurts and griefs. And yet it's how we relate to our Lord and our Saviour Jesus Christ during those times that have the biggest impact upon those who are watching us, those that are learning uh, from us. Also... Uh, there was a difficulty in the household, I suspect, in that a lot of the conversation was about somebody else's child. Uh, you know, uh, men, I can, I can say this to you with, with confidence, not from experience, but with confidence. If you spend your time talking about a woman that uh, you know at work, then uh, you, you, you're in some dangerous territory. And it's the same when you've got your family and you spend all your time talking about how great the kids are just a couple of doors down, how, how good they are, how great they are at sport or how, or how uh, good they are to their parents and so on. But undoubtedly a lot of the conversation taking place in this household was of another child. John was growing up with the, this knowledge that he had been specially set apart by God to prepare the way for someone who was infinitely greater than him. His ministry, by the way, was going to be relatively short as well. And no one could foresee, because they hadn't been told, how that ministry would end. But the truth is, a lot of the conversation would be about another child, this Jesus, that had been born to another family member who lived uh, a fair distance away. They, it's difficult to work out how much interaction, if any, they had during that interim period. But the conversation in that household was, John, you're only here to get the way ready for Jesus. It must be hard growing up like that, knowing that you're always, your whole life is to play second fiddle to someone infinitely greater. And that, that would be hard for John to deal with, I don't doubt. And yet, that was the training he received. And the witness and testimony of his parents emphasised and reinforced that training so that he accepted it and he embraced the calling that he had. So that's homeschooling. And uh, we want to move on to Sunday school. Now the truth is John never went to Sunday school in his life. That's because they had it on Saturdays in those days. On the Sabbath, undoubtedly, uh, they would go to the uh, synagogue and uh, uh, they would worship there. They would be taught there from God's 
word. His father was in the priestly family and occasionally, uh, undoubtedly, as John grew up, he would take John with him up to the temple. And maybe John had the privilege of seeing those priestly duties. It was expected he would be a priest as well. That's how it worked in those days. If you were born into a priestly family uh, as, a, as a boy, you would become a priest. But John's life was revolving around the worship of God in the synagogue or in the temple. John's life was immersed in the word of God. Now, of course, they didn't have Bibles to sit and read like you and me, and they certainly didn't have apps on their mobile phones and, and so on. But the word was ever present in John's life. And undoubtedly, as a, a child, as a young man, as, a, as an adult, growing up filled with the Spirit, he fed upon the Word of God. When he went to the synagogue, he would listen to the Scriptures being read and, and to their exposition, to someone explaining what those Scriptures actually meant. To the singing uh, of, of psalms uh, and songs. And then, of course, ultimately going up to the temple and getting over the, the glory of the building and beginning to understand the glory of the God to whom that building was dedicated. These are important things, vital things in the life of John's family. And John was learning what service was. He was learning what ministry was. He was learning how men could be useful to God and I say men I mean men and women there he was learning how people could serve God in all kinds of different capacities in the worship of his house John also had that unique addition to his life it's hinted to by the angel back in verse 15 excuse me let me just uh, take a sip here so back in verse 15 of chapter 1 The angel says, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink. And there's a hint there that actually John would be separated out in his, from his, the moment of his birth as a Nazarite. Some of you will know that the Nazarite vow. It is of someone who is completely dedicated to God and therefore has special sort of protections in their life. One is that they should not drink uh, alcohol. Uh, the other is they should not have their hair cut. And uh, the third is that they should never come into contact with a dead body, whether that be human or uh, animal. And so throughout his life, John would have those distinctives. Now, as a, as a young child, uh, not drinking alcohol probably wouldn't have cropped up very often. But he might have said, why do I never get my hair cut? You know, I want one of those uh, sort of Mohican things, or I want some nice drawings in the side of, of my head like you get now from the, the barbers. And uh, his parents would say, no, you are, are different. You're, you're separated out, and God has marked you to be holy for him, and he doesn't want you to uh, have these things, to experience these things, as a sign that you belong especially to him really interesting of course and not something for our study this morning but really interesting that the Lord Jesus didn't undertake that vow he drank alcohol he made uh, wine uh, for the wedding feast and uh, he, he was ready to be in the presence of death but John was separated out and he had these marks in his life but of course, even today, as families and as children, we have those marks. Not, not these in particular, but we have those particular things that mark us out as being Christians. We should have. There should be things that make us distinct from the world that is around us. There should be those difficult conversations between parents and children about things you can and cannot do. Uh, and it's a great sadness that in our modern society and in the modern church we're, we're, we're almost afraid to have those conversations we're afraid to say no to our kids you can't go to that sleepover because 
there's going to be things taking place there which we're not happy about. We're, we're Christians. We love God and we want to do the things that please him best. It's a pity that thing's taking place on a Sunday. We want you to, like us, to keep Sunday as a special day for the worship of God and for enjoying him and for relaxing and resting in the way that he has uh, given us a, as a gift. And there'll be other things, and, and undoubtedly uh, those of you that are parents are bumping up against those from time to time. Things that mark us out as different from the world around. We don't watch that film, we don't read that book, we don't do that thing. Because we love God. And we don't want to look back, we don't want to turn away from him, we want to, we want to be obedient to him and faithful to him and to honour him and to glorify him him and then we go to church and parents we need to be saying again with words and uh, by action we love going to church you know it might seem like a long hour and a half or a little bit longer if it's the pastor preaching it might seem to be a little bit frustrating and a little bit too long but we love this. Why? Because we're hearing God's word. We're reading God's word. We're singing God's word in the hymns and songs. We're meeting God's people. We're praying together. These are the things we love. And if we're not saying that, if we're not uh, showing that and demonstrating that in our lives, then that is a great tragedy and we shouldn't expect our kids to love them either. John's life was immersed in the, the word of God, the law of God, the worship of God, the ways of God, the service of God. And he grew to love it. The spirit within him, as John grew and matured and changed, said to him, these are good things. These are lovely things. These are delightful things. And we know that happened because if you just t turn to the very last verse of the chapter, verse 80, it says, and the child grew. This is John. The child grew and became strong in spirit and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. John was no robot. He was filled with the spirit from birth and yet from birth he had to learn all the things that you and I need to learn. And he had to assimilate them and, and he had to experience them. And his parents were playing a, a, a vital, pivotal role in training him up to be what God had purposed him to be. And we feel, we, we feel like that's all a bit robotic. In other words, it didn't really matter what Zechariah and Elizabeth did. John was going to turn out fine anyway. But I don't think they thought that at any point. Five years after John's birth, 10 years, 15 years, when that experience in the holy place for Zechariah and those, those strange months of Zechariah's dumbness and silence, when, when all the sort of rumours of angels and, and the experience with Mary and, uh, and <coughs> her strange uh, conception and so on, when all of these things started to fade in the, into the distance, you can imagine Zechariah and Elizabeth wondering, did we get that right? Did we really experience that? And are we doing it right now? Are we really raising this child up in a way that enables him to become what God wants him to become? Even if we had those promises, we would still be wrestling in our hearts and minds. There would still be sleepless nights, as there are when you're raising children. The thing that we most want for them, above anything else at all, the thing that we most want for them is that they come to love Jesus like we love Jesus. They come to experience what we have experienced by the power of the Holy Spirit. They come to love the Lord their God and worship and serve him as we love to worship and serve him. That They're going to share with us that eternity in the glory of the new heavens and the new earth uh, that is promised to us through the saving work of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what they become after that. 
it doesn't matter if they become shelf stackers at Aldi or they become nuclear physicists and, and change the world somehow as long as they come to know Christ. And there'll be many sleepless nights, many difficult moments, many awkward conversations, many moments of doubt and fear as we seek to train our children in the ways of the Lord without imposing on them a faith that is not really theirs. It is the greatest delight when a child turns and says, however young that child may be, however old the child may be, when a child turns and says, I believe that Jesus is God's son and that he came from heaven and died on the cross to save me from my sins. That's what it is to become a Christian, to believe that and to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever else we want for you kids, we want that above all things. And then, lastly, I've named it Forest School, though for John it was Wilderness School. These days, uh, particularly amongst the, the younger, the early years in school, uh, it's uh, uh, the latest thing, that you go outside of the classroom and you uh, go into uh, some uh, sort of natural environment uh, and you learn lessons. You sort of put away the books uh, and you stop listening to the teacher at the front and you go somewhere into the woods or whatever or to a, a pond or a lake or something uh, and you just sort of experiment and learn from real life. Uh, well, for John, it was the school of the wilderness. That sort of verse 80 again gives the impression that uh, he was born, uh, he was circumcised and then he was taken out and, and left in the wilderness somehow. That isn't the truth at all. His parents were elderly. Uh, we know that because they'd been praying for years and had basically, I guess, stopped praying for a child because naturally it was never going to happen. Uh, and when John was born, they, they, were, they were older. And undoubtedly, as he grew up in his young age, uh, they passed away, for they're not mentioned again. And it's therefore after that point that John decided, uh, led by the Spirit, to go into the wilderness where he, he lived. Uh, a rough life, a, a harsh life. Uh, and we know that he, he dressed in rough clothes and he ate locusts and things like that, uh, which would be naturally to be found out there in the wilderness. It was going to be a harsh, harsh experience for him. He too had left behind the classroom, the books, and was going to spend some time on his own in the wilderness, just him and his God. Learning the most valuable lessons, which are the lessons we learn from real life. Now, of course, we learn uh, wonderful things from God's word, but those wonderful things take on a new meaning a new power in us when we experience the realities of them in the real world, if you like. The wilderness is, uh, in the Bible, a place of testing. You know, the uh, Israelites uh, left Egypt and they went into the wilderness. And again, as we were reminded this morning, uh, they looked back. They said, well, life was so good back in Egypt. It wasn't good at all. They were miserable in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. They, they were punished and, and beaten and they didn't have the good food. But they sort of have some fictional remembrance of what Egypt was like. And, and they failed the test and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. So that whole generation died out. The Lord Jesus went into the wilderness. Well, just 40 days, but 40 days without food. 40 days on his own, 40 days being reduced to his lowest ebb physically and, and mentally and, and spiritually too, dare one say, until he is met with the devil himself who is going to test him. What are you going to do now after all this time? And so John did spend years in the wilderness, between uh, down in the Judean wilderness in the south of uh, Israel, as we call it, he spent many months, many years 
just him and his God. There's a suggestion that he uh, uh, joined the Essene community down at Qumran. Undoubtedly, he came across them. I, I don't think he joined them. He wasn't an Essene in that sense. The point was that he was to spend this time in the wilderness on his own, just him and God. And it would be a testing time. You know, I think also, one thing about that wilderness in the, the southern part of Israel, it's like a living Bible. He could go to the place, uh, where, the places where David went, where Abraham went, where Jacob went, and uh, where Joshua was, and, and all, the, not all, but many of the great events of Old Testament scripture took place. He would be walking literally in the footsteps of the fathers of the faith. He would be experiencing what they experienced and seeing what they saw. Uh, and his experience of God would grow through those things. We love to learn from our parents. and We love to see their values and their goals and uh, their priorities as, as valuable in the same way. We love to adopt them as best we can. We love to go to God's house and listen to the teaching of his word and, uh, and uh, meditating upon that and applying that as God brings it to us in the course of the, the days that follow. But we learn very powerful lessons out there through those doors out there in that world and whether it's in our classroom at school or whether it's in our workplace or whether it's in our family circumstance whatever it is the lessons of real life bring home powerfully to us the power of the gospel in us I would not want to uh, have a, a surgeon operate on me who says oh, I, I've just learned all this from books I don't want that. I want someone who's been there and who's had his hands on the real thing, who's studied uh, under people who really do know what they're talking about. And we don't want to learn our Christian faith entirely from books. We want to learn it from this book, but then we want to live it out there in that world. And there will be occasions when we are led by the Spirit of God, as it were, into a wilderness where we're going to have to learn the hardest lessons, but the best lessons of all. We're going to be tested and tried. Where we're going to get to a place where we really are able to ask the question, is this real? Is God real? Is the Lord Jesus a reality to me and in me? Is the Spirit of God really indwelling me? Is the Word of God really living in and through me? And it's largely out there in the wilderness that we get the answers to those questions in a powerful and vital way. Sometimes the Lord will take us into the wilderness for a shorter or for a longer time. Sometimes we will go through experiences and challenges and, and trials and difficulties which test and prove our faith to be what it really is. It is not our faith, but it is the faith that God has implanted in us by his Spirit that it is the Lord Jesus Christ who is keeping his promise in those moments to not leave us nor forsake us. That God is showing to us that he is working his purposes out and those purposes might be quite hard to get hold of but he is accomplishing wonderful things in us and through us by the experiences we're going through. The school of real life the school of our experiences, the school that proves to us that the word of God is, is living and, and active, the spirit of God is powerfully at work, the love of the Lord Jesus is wonderfully embracing us in the midst of our trials and difficulties, and the power of God to do what is right, even when it feels so wrong, is overwhelming. John had to learn all of that and more 
as he wandered in the harsh conditions of the Judean wilderness. He had to wrestle with his own thoughts. He had to battle with his doubts and fears. He had to challenge his, his own desire to be the number one uh, and to always be the number two. He had to prepare himself for the fact that when he announced the Messiah had come, the majority of the people listening to him would say, don't talk such nonsense, don't talk such rubbish. And he came out of that wilderness and was revealed to Israel. He began to talk about repentance and faith and the Messiah who was coming. And one day he would point to that Messiah and say, look, the Lamb of God, Jesus, who takes away the sins of the world. His whole life had been building up to that moment. He was a disruptor of the status quo. It's, um, it's nice that, uh, uh, that um, Dragon's Den is back on. It's one of those weirdly fascinating programs and what the dragons are often looking out for is what's called a disruptor that is something that changes what we've grown used to uh, uber is something that's done it you know it used to be you could get a, a a black taxi in london or you could pay for a private hire car that was it now uber well you can get all kinds of lifts and rides and all kinds of people can be involved in the business it's a disruptor well john was a disruptor he was going to appear to the Israelites and say, you need to break out of your complacency, your procrastination, your avoidance of the reality, and you need to realise the Messiah has come. And he broke down the, the hardness of their hearts, the resistance of their characters, and he pointed people to Jesus. All his life had led up to that very thing. And let's pray as parents that our lives have pointed our children to the Lord Jesus Christ, whether they followed or not, that we have been faithful in pointing them to him. Let's pray for our children, just the, our own children and the children more widely in the church. We pray for them that they are growing up, seeing good models and examples of love for God, of love for the Lord Jesus, of service and ministry and spiritual activity and life and let's pray too that when they see us in those wilderness days weeks months or years that we are faithful to the god who called us and that he is being faithful to us may the lord bless us and teach us from these things we're going to uh, sing our, our closing uh, song now i ask the lord that i might grow